Welcome to Glass Half Full with Leslie Krongold. She shares her stories, experiences, and knowledge of living and coping with a chronic health condition. Learn about tools and resources and hear inspirational interviews that help you to live a life filled with quality and dignity. With two decades of support group leadership, Leslie's ready to help you make lemonade out of life's lemons. Are you ready? Hello and welcome to my community. Well, I'm going to share a little about myself with you in this inaugural podcast and hopefully you'll join me to become part of this community. Believe me, I don't want to spend all this time talking with myself. I'd much prefer a conversation with another human. And that's what we'll do for the future episodes. I'll have conversations with others, friends, caregivers, and other people coping with a chronic health condition, as well as practitioners and healers who have helped people develop positive coping tools. And eventually, I hope you'll become part of this conversation and the community. I'm Leslie Krongold. I live in Northern California, and I'm originally from Miami, Florida. My journey has been a surprise. You don't really think about health problems when you're a teenager and young adult. You feel invincible most of the time. Saying I had a normal childhood really means little except in the context of now having a chronic health condition that shapes how and what I do every day. My health was generally good in my earlier life and I'm grateful for that. Though many of the minor anomalies I experience now make sense as part of this slowly progressive genetic condition I have. But let me start with another part of the story and work backwards. I don't relish telling my story. I'm more the type of person that poses questions to others asking about their story. And I tend to take a back seat. But I feel my story is perhaps relevant for you to understand how I came to launch a podcast called Glass Half Full and why you might want to join me for this part of the journey. In my mid-30s, I distinctly remember going out to lunch with a work colleague. And as I grasped the door handle to get out of his car, my hand wouldn't release its grip. I don't think he noticed, but I certainly did. It was odd, and it would hearken back to a memory from several years prior of my mother talking about difficulty with her wrists and grip. My mother had had many different ailments when I was growing up and spent time in hospitals for cataract surgery, gallbladder surgery, gastrointestinal stress, breathing problems, you name it. She also had a lifestyle of cigarette smoking and daily alcohol consumption that could have exacerbated her health. So suffice it to say, I was neither on top of each medical diagnosis nor hospital visit she had since I lived across the country. She had told me about a muscle condition which necessitated a visit to the University of Miami Medical School where medical students observed her calf muscles. Apparently, One leg had less muscle tone than the other leg. I don't recall her telling me it was a rare muscular dystrophy, and I certainly didn't hear that it was hereditary. What I most remember is a phone call approximately 13 months before she died when my parents told me she had had a seizure, was rushed to the hospital, and eventually diagnosed with brain cancer, which metastasized from lung cancer. During those 13 months, I visited her a few times and talked with her frequently. My father never mentioned the doctors knew she would die within a year. I thought the radiation treatments and drugs were to help cure her. Of course, this is nearly 25 years ago. So when I reached for the door in my friend's car and couldn't quite release my grip, I remembered my mom. Now, I can't recall how soon after that experience I went to see a doctor. Maybe I had a few more experiences of difficulty releasing my hand grip. But the way my memory works is like a project management software program. The lunch with the work colleague 
in getting out of his car in Menlo Park was a milestone. The next point, if my, were, if my life were to look like a Gantt chart, a Gantt chart is a type of bar chart developed by Henry Gantt in the early 1900s that illustrates a project schedule. Anyhow, this Gantt chart, the next point would be a visit with my HMO's general practitioner. I had seen her maybe once or twice before. I probably thought she seemed like a good doctor with whatever minor issue I'd presented her with. Well, after her cursory check of my hands and muscles, she scheduled me for blood work panel to see if I was nutritionally deficient. These tests came back negative, and then she scheduled me for a visit to a neurologist, a neurologist, a brain doctor. I don't think my public school education included much study of human anatomy, and my college study of filmmaking certainly didn't cover neurology. Well, my memory of the next few steps is muddled. How many times did I see the neurologist until she had a definitive diagnosis? I'm not sure. That definitive diagnosis included a DNA test, which resulted in confirmation that I had a rare disorder called myotonic dystrophy. Seeing the results on paper didn't emotionally penetrate me, but the diagnostics leading up to the DNA test is what I most remember. The EMG, and an EMG is a electromyography uh, or an electrodiagnostic medicine technique for evaluating and recording the electrical activity produced by skeletal muscles. And this was accomplished by the neurologist inserting a needle into several of my muscles, mostly different parts of my legs and listening for extended bursts of electrical discharges that are indicative of abnormal electrical signals associated with the slowing of muscle relaxation. So I lay there, you know, in an uncomfortable paper gown, and this specialist is probing my body with needles, and I heard these very disturbing sounds. And the neurologist, who was a her young and super smart woman got excited. It must be like finding those key puzzle pieces to solve a mysterious puzzle. Eureka! I have identified your rare condition. And whatever words she used to explain this epiphany to me, I don't recall, but I do remember a feeling of, your life is not what you expected it to be. And I know I stifled a few tears, and I remember wondering if she was aware of how this moment was impacting me. After that, I'm sure I shared the news with a few friends, but I can't remember anyone's reaction, really. My everyday life was essentially the same. I worked a lot. At that time, I was an educational multimedia producer, and my work life involved a lot of travel across the country. My father's reaction to my diagnosis was a few notches short of empathetic. He claimed to have talked with doctors that reassured him I had nothing to worry about. My life would be normal. I didn't know anyone with myotonic dystrophy, but I was aware that it was one of the many neuromuscular diseases covered by the Patient Advocacy Organization Muscular Dystrophy Association, or MDA. Who in America hadn't grown up with the annual Jerry Lewis Labor Day Telethon to raise money and awareness for children with neuromuscular disease? Children did seem to be the emphasis. Jerry's kids, as they were known, didn't, they, they didn't exactly include the millions of adults beset with a diagnosed later in life. In one of the several ironies in my life, I was already very familiar with the MDA. In grade school, I was tempted to organize a carnival to raise money for, EM for MDA. The local television show of Skipper Chuck and his weirdo sidekick Scrubby the Sailor promoted backyard carnivals. I sent away for the carnival kit instructions and remember sharing them with the neighborhood friends. We never did get the gumption to hold a fundraiser, but later on in high school, I made up for it. 
In high school, I threw myself into charity work conducted through the auspices of school service clubs. I would drive to the local MDA office in Miami, Florida to help with mailings, folding letters, addressing envelopes, licking stamps. Yes, I licked a lot of U.S. postage stamps before the advent of adhesive stamps. Soon after this initiation, I organized two dance marathons at the local Skylake Mall to raise money for MDA. During one of the high school summers, I was a camp counselor at the week-long camp for children with muscle diseases. It was a one-to-one experience. At 16 years old, I was responsible for taking care of a girl only two years younger than me that had a congenital condition that affected her both physically and cognitively. And congenital refers to a disease or physical abnormality that is present from birth. Back then, I think the term mental retardation was still in vogue. It took me several years after my diagnosis to realize that the young girl who was my camper had the congenital form of myotonic dystrophy. Talk about irony. The camp experience was a turning point for me. Most significant were a few conversations I had with campers that were several years younger than myself. I'm not sure if I'm remembering their names accurately. Chris Leone and Susan Morse. I haven't seen either of them since camp, and it's possible neither of them is still alive. These kids were so wise, so positive, so life-affirming. During that week, one of the other campers died. I knew the young man. I'd become friendly with his counselor. This camp counselor experience was pivotal in my development as an empathetic adult. So here I was, in my mid-thirties, diagnosed with a progressive muscle disease, and I naturally thought of my prior experiences with this patient advocacy organization. I called their local office in Northern California, registered with them, and found out about their monthly support group meetings. Again, my memories are not clear, but the internet did exist then, when I was diagnosed, and I certainly googled my diagnosis. I'm not sure when I came upon the graph. I'll tell you more about the graph, but for now, let's just call it the graph. I can't say I learned very much about the condition from the internet at that time. The MDA had some information about the multi-systemic nature of myotonic dystrophy and its slow progression. There were photos of men with the condition, balding men with long, thin faces, hollowed cheeks and temples, wasted arm and leg muscles. It wasn't pretty. At that point, I had no obvious physically identifying characteristics of the condition. And all the black and white photos showed these men from an earlier era. It was easy to distance myself from this. It was the graph I found on some academic website. The graph was part of a medical journal article assessing the average lifespan of someone diagnosed with my condition. The graph was organized by the genetic identifier, the CTG count, from the DNA blood test I had. CTG is a trinucleotide located on a specific chromosome. The trinucleotide normally repeats for all humans, but when it has expanded repeats, it signifies the presence of the condition. Healthy people have up to 50 CTG repeats. Children with the congenital form of the condition may have a thousand or more CTG repeats. I had approximately 500 repeats, which was defined as classic adult onset. According to the graph, my life expectancy was between 48 to 55 years old. Did I cry myself to sleep the evening after I discovered this online graph? I'm not sure. I think it had a delayed impact on me. The data would haunt me intermittently. It was a battle between my rational and irrational mind. I knew there would be no crystal ball and there were always statistical outliers. In statistics, an outlier is an observation or value that lies at an abnormal distance from the other values in a random sample from the population. 
For now, I kept my diagnosis and fearful thoughts to myself and limited my disclosure to others, but I did attend the MDA support group meeting. I knew little about support groups. Individual psychotherapeutic counseling was familiar to me. I had friends involved in 12-step programs, but until that point, I knew little, if anything, about support groups. The meeting took place in the early afternoon on a weekend at a local hotel's conference room. The table was long and rectangular. Most attendees were seated in chairs, though a few people were in wheelchairs or using other assistive mobility devices. This didn't unnerve me, though I've heard it does freak others out when they first attend a support group meeting for their chronic health condition. It's that visual of what the future may hold reliance on a device, weakness. I think I was more filled with curiosity than fear. People were pleasant at the meeting, though the facilitator, a middle-aged woman with a neuromuscular condition different than mine, made little effort to find out more about me. I was struck by how much her personality and personal story dominated the meetings. It didn't surprise me that after a few sessions, She decided to leave the organization due to facilitator burnout. What was a surprise was MDA's request that I sign on as the meeting's next facilitator. The liaison between the MDA office staff and the actual support group meeting is a person with the title Health Care Services Coordinator. This role was often filled by an eager recent college grad that would end up leaving the organization within a year because it is an incredibly stressful job for a young person. This coordinator got to know a little about me, but saw nothing in my background that would have assured her that I was the right fit. But she changed my life, and for that, I am forever grateful. If only I could remember her name and thank her personally. And 17 years later, here I am. But there's more to this story. I just wanted to acknowledge that this is another milestone for the Gantt chart of my life. Duly noted, I hope. Do I remember the first support group meeting I facilitated? Not one bit. I may have notes for it in a file somewhere. What I do remember is MDA gave me nothing to prepare myself. There was no guide on how to facilitate a support group, no training, nothing. I did have teaching experience, middle and high school, as well as community college experience. I was an educator, and that's how I approached this gathering of adults with a shared diagnosis of a chronic health condition. I'd like to make a distinction now between a chronic and acute health condition. Many conditions may begin as acute. There is an urgent need to take care of something wrong, an imbalance. And perhaps there's success with bringing the body back into balance. But for many of us with health conditions where there is no cure or treatment, we engage in a continuous challenge to maintain balance of a chronic condition. And with this perspective, I assume much of life for many humans is just that, a continuous challenge to maintain balance. So although I view the target audience for this podcast as others coping with a chronic health condition like myself, I know there are caregivers as well as others who are trying to maintain a healthy balance in life with an optimistic glass half full perspective. Okay, back to support groups. I've really learned so much from this path. I've met so many people of diverse life experience, ethnic, racial, religious, and cultural affiliations, and diverse socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. Had I not had this support group connection for the last two decades, I don't know if I would have met so many wonderful and different people. I can't possibly summarize what I've learned all these years in this first podcast, but I hope to continue learning and sharing and growing a community with you. So let's go back to my diagnosis and life after taking on the role of a support group facilitator. I continued to work on my job for a while until I got sick. I'd been getting sick frequently with the long hours and constant work travel, arriving home after work and napping on the couch for a while. 
But I see another milestone being this one day I had to be in Monterey, California for a work meeting. Every month I would take the two plus hour trip to meet with a team in, in Monterey that I worked with. It was the same routine. Come in the night before, sleep in a local hotel, and spend the next day in meetings. Well, this time, the hotel's air conditioning system wasn't working, and I had a rather sleepless night. I was listless during the meetings and ended up leaving for home earlier than usual. And my car's air conditioning system wasn't working well either, so I had to stop frequently on the drive home to get water and use the restroom. I was feeling pretty sick, pretty nauseous, um, and by the time I got home, I was completely wiped out. Physically, I was exhausted and very weak. My heart was racing. The anxiety had kicked in, but I wasn't aware of the difference between the actual physical symptoms and the symptoms from the anxiety. I was feeling things I'd never felt before, and it scared me. So I called 911 and was brought to the hospital ER. And once there, I told them about myotonic dystrophy, and they didn't know what it was. All I wanted to do was sleep. After I threw up a few times, and and in, at some point in the middle of the night, they released me without any type of diagnosis. I didn't know if it was heat exhaustion, food poisoning. Nobody knew. But the next few days, I realized that my body was just not able to handle the same stress it had been under for years. You know, the normal stressors of life. Making a living, moving up the career ladder taking care of your home and your personal life, having a social life. Well, shortly after this hospital incident, I left my full-time job to pursue freelance contract work where I felt I could have more control over my life. This wasn't an easy decision to make, but I felt so lousy I couldn't think of different options available to me. It may have been a time to explore other options, maybe discuss my health condition with my employer, take a short disability leave. I wasn't in a frame of mind to imagine other possibilities. I just wanted to get out, and I did. The next 10 years were interesting. I had more time to explore other healing modalities for myself, as well as bring in guest speakers for the support group meetings. And some of the modalities I was already fluent with, yoga for example. Um, Shortly after college, I began taking yoga classes and learning a lot about yoga. You know, it's not just poses like Downward Dog. I can remember some of the first times I did poses with twists and my body would react in a sort of healthy cleansing sort of way. It's a difficult sensation to describe because it's subtle, but practicing yoga has really helped me physically, emotionally, as well as spiritually. At support group meetings, I was introduced to acupuncture. A local acupuncture college sent student practitioners to one of our meetings to do a presentation. And since it was a teaching college, they had incredibly inexpensive treatment options. So I went down that path and learned more about my body and diet. Every month at the support group, there was more to learn, not just with alternative modalities and mind-body therapies, but also from Western trained physicians and healthcare professionals such as physical, occupational, and respiratory therapists. It was fascinating to see how their presentations changed over 17 years. One physical therapist in particular, a very popular and well-liked woman, would garner a large, a large audience at the group and she demonstrate, you know, a variety of physical movements for different types of people, given whatever their mobility challenge was. Well, the last time she spoke with our group, maybe about two years ago, she ended the session sharing with us her experiences with meditation and mindfulness. This was a real departure from her usual presentation and proof that times have certainly changed. The support group meetings included all types of information pragmatic information brought to us from federal and regional regional agencies such as Social Security Administration, in-home health services and Department of Rehabilitation, nonprofit organizations specializing in training and providing service animals, 
researchers discussing the process for inclusion in clinical research trials, and demonstrations of food preparation for dysphagia, swallowing difficulties, to name just a few. As I got to know the people attending my support groups, I realized how much knowledge and wisdom many of them had. I'm a strong believer in empowering people, so several sessions had support group participants take the lead and share what expertise they had developed. One man who had been using a wheelchair for many years talked with us about navigating the various modes of public transportation. For many people who eventually need to use a wheelchair for their own safety in public, the entire process can be daunting. Another group participant gave us a presentation about working with a private athletic trainer who grew to understand more about her condition. And several other participants became savvy travelers and taught us how to arrange for the safest and most expeditious airport experience, how to secure accessible hotel rooms, and which foreign countries are the most accessible. Over the years, the support group experience became a bigger part of my life. I worked part-time, learned more about my changing body, and shared what I was learning with my support groups. And at some point, I acquired a second support group that met in a different city. So this really took a, a good chunk of my life and time and energy and focus. You know, when you have a chronic health condition, you can't help but spend more time managing your physical and emotional health. Your life trajectory changes. Your peers are climbing the career ladder, raising their children, and you're weighing the options for dealing with weakness and fatigue. Although my condition has no treatment, there are a variety of pharmaceuticals many of my friends take to manage some of their symptoms. I repeatedly, I repeatedly have chosen not to take any pills beyond the occasional Tylenol for body pain. I'm not sure why I'm like this. Perhaps it's a reaction to the numerous drugs and treatments I witnessed my mother and, uh, and other relatives take. I've chosen to manage my symptoms through diet, exercise, attitude, and a nightly hot bath. This works for me, and I will continue along this path for as long as I can. I can't say one thing that I do is a silver bullet, but with more control over my daily life, I'm happy to say that I've not had another ER visit. The support groups I've facilitated have been open groups. Each month would bring several core members who have become like family to me, but we'd also have new people attend. Maybe they were newly diagnosed, or after several years since the diagnosis, they were at a point where they needed to reach out. I've met hundreds of people through these groups, and in 17 years, I've seen a lot of variety. The negative experiences are minimal, but they did stand out, and I learned from them as well. What I've been most struck by are people who refuse to change anything in their lifestyle. They'll openly speak about the misery they're experiencing, be it body pain, gastrointestinal discomfort, weakness, and or emotional issues, and they're stuck, unable to examine their diet or lifestyle to see if something is within their power to change. For example, there was a middle-aged man that attended the group for a few months who told us about his constant GI stress when he often could not leave his house. He couldn't be away from a bathroom. And upon further questioning, you know, I was talking to him about this, I found out that he drank soda all day long and the majority of his diet was processed food. I'm not one to admonish and I don't dole out advice, but as a group, you, the other support group members, we did talk with him about trying to make gradual dietary changes, and he was completely resistant. So every once in a while, there would be a visitor to the group with a similar attitude. And I began to wonder, why are some people able to make incremental changes in their behavior, see positive results as feedback, and adjust their lifestyle accordingly, and others aren't able to do this? Well, obviously, there are no easy answers here, but I wanted to explore this area. It intrigued me. And during this time, I was also working on small projects, paid projects, for different departments at a local medical school. 
research projects for a variety of audiences, such as teaching children at an elementary school how to practice good oral health, advising dentists on how to identify victims of domestic abuse, and helping low-income adults with diabetes type 2 make healthier food choices. I decided to return to school to pursue a doctorate degree in education, and my line of research explored the role of support group facilitators and how they promote social support and self-management health behaviors in the context of a support group. Social support is a general term used to describe five different areas of support offered in a social setting. These are information support, which is any communication offering suggestions or guidance, referral to an expert, a book or website, or sharing personal experience. Tangible assistance is any communication or act providing direct or indirect tasks alone or willingness to assist some assist someone in some capacity. Esteem support is any communication offering a compliment, validation, or relief of blame. Network support is any communication providing access to others that are part of the immediate social network. And emotional support is any communication or act expressing care and concern. Self-management health behaviors are a set of behaviors to help a person manage their own illness. Some of these behaviors include diet, exercise, and relaxation techniques. During this time, I read as much of the previous research literature I could. Studies predominantly included people with more common health conditions, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. Very few of the studies were with people with neuromuscular disease, let alone myotonic dystrophy, but I saw so many similarities for people with chronic illness. After facilitating my, my own support group for many years, I finally had the opportunity to see how other groups operate. For one research class I had in school, I was able to visit and observe support groups for adults with Parkinson's disease, another for multiple sclerosis, and another for ALS. And for my dissertation, I worked with two national MS patient advocacy organizations and surveyed over 300 facilitators of MS support groups across the country. I won't take this time now to go deeper into my research findings, but I will share bits of it when appropriate during future podcast episodes. And at some point during this research, I realized I wanted to work with support group facilitators, and that's what I had an opportunity to do for these last four years. At the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, under the Patient Advocacy Organization, I was able to launch support groups throughout the U.S., Canada, and Switzerland, and train over 30 people to become support group facilitators. It was an amazing experience. So what about this glass half full thing, you may be wondering? Well, it's the next chapter in my life. I want to continue doing what I've done, learn more, reach out to more people to share how life with a chronic health condition can be challenging, but how one can continue to lead a life of quality and integrity. I'm certainly not the only one to choose to have a glass half full perspective. I've been fortunate to meet many people, men and women of all ages, all backgrounds, who in spite of a physical and or emotional challenge have adapted new ways to live and they'll share their passion and ways of coping with us. I'll also meet with people and organizations engaged in alternative healing modalities, mind-body disciplines that either I or someone close to me has explored with positive results. Some of the areas I've explored include diet, yoga therapy, acupuncture, Pilates, aromatherapy, meditation, and Qigong. But that's just me. Let's hear about what works for you. What helps you maintain a glass half full perspective? I hope you've heard something during this first podcast that has whet your appetite and inspires you to keep tuning in. I invite you to become part of the conversation and community by visiting our website, glasshalffull.online, and the Facebook page for 
glass half full online. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to Glass Half Full. Leslie invites you to leave a rating and review on iTunes. This helps spread the word to others dealing with chronic health issues. For show notes, updates, and more, visit the website glasshalffull.online. Glasshalffull.online.